Good morning. Uh, I would like to begin the um, Committee for Special Populations on February 4th, 2020. Good morning, everybody. How Good are morning. you doing? Good morning. I'm going to start with introductions. Good morning. I'm Carla Silvestri, school board member. Good morning, Sabrina Hernandez, the recorder for the Board of Education. Good morning, Maria Navarro, Chief Academic Officer. Good morning, Danielle Saskin, Coordinator of Legislative Affairs for the Board of Education. Lori Christina Webb, Chief of Staff for the Board. Judy Daka, member of the Board. Great. So, um, very quickly, the informational summary. Any changes, concerns, mm -hmm. or anything? Okay. So then we shall begin with our first agenda item, which is the um, gifted and talented summary. Gifted and talented students with learning disabilities. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, so our team is coming up, um, and we will do introductions for the team. Yep. To come forward. Mr. Lowndes will also join us. Oh, OK, first. Great. <laughs> Um, and uh, just as a, as folks are setting up, just as a reminder, um, we wanted to take a look at this comprehensively for both. Um, we've talked before um, to the board around supporting um, our gifted students in a multitude of ways, but for special populations, we wanted to hone in on two populations specifically. And those are it, those two bodies of work will focus on our students who are students with disabilities who are also gifted, mm -hmm. and also the work that we've been doing um, specifically in our Title I schools around gifted education. So you will hear uh, both of those updates. Um, as a reminder, staff is also here to listen and take some notes from board uh, board members and and discuss a little bit about what ideas and. Um, and things that the board committee uh, thinks that the board at large would like to learn more about. Um, so we will also be taking notes. So with that, I'll ask staff to introduce themselves so we can get started. Good morning, my name is Krishana Dean. I'm the supervisor of Accelerated and Enriched Instruction. Good morning, Dr. Sarah Sergo. I'm one of the directors in the Office of School Support and Improvement, and I supervise two programs with first twice exceptional students. Good morning, Philip Lynch, Director, Department of Special Education Services. Good morning. All righty. Good morning. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Taking a look at our charge, um, some of the work that we have done has actually started over an, a decade ago um, with a partnership with the Saturday School and former Deputy Dr. Frida Lacey. Uh, over 10 years ago, we recognized that there was a disparity in students who were accessing enriched and accelerated programming in and outside of their schools. And so one of the ways we wanted to mitigate that was to provide enriched opportunities for them through a program called the Young Scholars Program, which is a, a partnership again with the Saturday School. And what we were able to do was to build an enrichment program um, for select students coming from uh, uh, several elementary schools. And we built a model in that um, structure right there. And so we realized we're meeting some of the needs, but not enough of the needs. And so we extended our partnership with Title I schools. And our charge here still remains the same, is to provide greater access to curriculum for highly able students, ensuring that the institutional barriers to participation are removed, and that the opportunities are afforded to students regardless of their background. So one of the ways that we have come together to start trying to change the trajectory of our students in our Title I schools is through a four-prong approach. And, and we're very pleased with this work. I have to say that we've actually been invited by the National Association for Gifted Children to present this work that we started here in Montgomery That's so County. That's exciting. It really is. <laughs> so Congratulations. Start, thank you. Thank you. Um, and we've, we've we're on network with a number of school districts much like Montgomery County in this work. So we're continually learning and growing. But it started off um, thinking about what can we do for students in the summertime to reduce or mitigate that summer loss? And so in the summer of July 2015, we established a enriched uh, summer program for our students in Title I schools. And it was dovetailed with the already established ELO sale program. And so students were given an opportunity to engage in critical and creative thinking, um, math, science, and technology. 
And so we felt we were very excited about it because we also were able to extend that experience to parents and families to really take the opportunity to explain all of the program opportunities that are afforded our children in Montgomery County. And here is a way that you can start to address some of those needs in the summertime. Well, we realized that's not enough. You know, the summer is a great starting point, but what do we do during the school day? So in August of that year, we started to establish Enriched Extended Day. Title I schools have notoriously received funds for um, enriched programming, and oftentimes they're used for homework club, reading club, and things of that nature. But what about enriched opportunities? What about a robotics club? What about something that mirrors what the students engaged in in their summertime? This is a great way to change the narrative of how we look at how we use our, our Title I funds to also not only um, close the achievement gap, but to also enrich our students who demonstrate a need for further uh, enrichment. And so that was another exciting component, but there's still more work to be done. So what we decided was in November of 2015, we established a professional learning community for all of the Title I schools at that time, because it's really important that we take a look at that first point of instruction. What are we doing during the course of the day? So we brought together building leaders. There were principals. There were staff development teachers. There were reading specialists that came together to study the model that we introduced in ELO STEP. How are we enriching our students? And so through that professional development opportunity, we recognize that there's a need to really, again, change the narrative of how we're addressing enrichment in our Title I schools. And so we've really been focusing on three through five, but if you really want to make a change, you have to start in the early years. And so this is where primary talent development started. It's identified in our COMAR for gifted and talented education. How are we documenting advanced learning behaviors? How are we nurturing talent in our students? And so we adopted a program developed by uh, Maryland State Department of Education through the uh, Javits grant on what we wanted to do was to make sure that every child had the experience. It wasn't based solely on criteria, but every student in a Title I school starting in kindergarten would receive enrichment and accelerated opportunities through a primary talent development model. It's a critical and creative thinking uh, curriculum that integrates child development practices as well as gifted education. We also have primary talent development coaches in our schools. So just quickly, I wanted to share with you that all of our students engage in open-ended, hands-on, problem-solving experiences. And these experiences are roughly um, designed to help build students' own internal learning behaviors that have been um, affiliated with academic success, such as we're nurturing persistence, inquisitiveness. We know our students love to ask questions, uh, communicative, um, Perceptive. A number of these strategies are really important. Learning behaviors are very important for our students to be able to engage in. Um, and so the program helps to nurture that with all of our students in Title I schools. This, demograph this uh, graph here shows you how many children we serve and the services on which um, are included in our Title I schools. So this is the makeup of the children that we are serving currently. So the goals of our program, one, the hallmark of this program is, is that there is a .5 full-time coach dedicated to this work. And that, that's really essential because this coach is responsible for ensuring that all these opportunities are provided to every one of the students in a Title I school. The key here is that this coach is not only an uh, instructional partner with the classroom teacher, but they're also an advocate. And I think that piece is very important, is that they help to advocate for programming opportunities for our students inside and beyond the classroom. The other piece is we're building a profile of our students from kindergarten to second grade. That's three years worth of data where we can use that to help us to document how are we differentiating instruction? How are we providing advanced programming to those students who demonstrate a need in discrete areas? And then the other piece is providing models of what are called the essential strategies and really developing some of that conceptual understanding in our students so that they can transfer it to new um, and innovative learning situations, which is often found in our enriched and accelerated programming. And so we couldn't do this work without the partners sitting in front of you. We're very fortunate that 
this work um, really helps us to see the bigger picture of what this system is about, making sure that um, all of our students are thriving and all of our students are receiving these opportunities. So our office here, we're part of the professional learning and the program development. We support schools directly and we support the uh, coaches. Our Title I department, uh, we couldn't do this without their funding support. That's very important. Thank you, Title I. And so they also are partners with us in the professional learning. The equity unit, this part is very important because we recognize that we're also asking the coaches to be equity warriors. We want to make sure that students are receiving opportunities and that families are informed of these opportunities. We also want to make sure that we're mitigating any type of implicit bias that may occur that may interrupt the opportunities that are afforded to students. So that's very important for us. And then lastly, our uh, colleagues in the uh, elementary integrated curriculum team, they help us with aligning the, the program to the curriculum because we want teachers to be able to see how these align to first points of instruction. And so what do the coaches do to support our teachers? Uh, one of the pieces here is that they, direct, they provide direct support to the teachers through a number of models. One, through direct instruction to students because it allows teachers to, to observe how they model some of this key instruction. The other piece is they co-teach. And then lastly, they, they um, support collaborative planning. That piece is very important too. It's very important for the coaches to help teachers to see where they can find opportunities for enrichment um, for their students. I said before they serve as teacher leaders, equity warriors. Uh, we have a number of programs in our system that do still require our families to be informed about what is afforded um, to them, whether it's a deadline, whether it's even inquiring about an assessment for a particular program. These coaches are very keen on making sure that students that they see, they can really thrive from that experience, that they engage the family so that the family knows what's available to them, whether they choose to partake in it or not. And then they're really pivotal in helping us to increase access to enriched accelerated programming directly in the school, whether it is through our direct curriculum or some of the supplemental resources that a number of our students engage in, such as Junior Great Books, Jacob's Ladder, William and Mary programs such as those. Um, I shared before, they provide, they receive professional learning, but they also deliver it to their staff and to the school. I think that piece is very important because it requires more than just one person to facilitate this work. So they really help to build the capacity of the classroom teacher. And they monitor student performance data. How are students doing? What happens when you see a dip in a student's performance or a bump up in a student's performance? Does the classroom instruction mirror what the student is demonstrating? That piece is very important. And so here you have our GT identification, and I'm sorry the graphic is a bit small, but what you will find is that as the years have gone on, we've noticed a bump up, um, except for 2018-19, but we didn't, uh, we also had a drop in the number of Title I schools, but you'll see an increase in the identification of our students, and the identification of gifted and talented. That is just one measure that we look at to make sure that we are identifying and seeing um, our students and, and the benefits of the program. The other piece is how many of our students are receiving access to accelerated and enriched instruction. I'm proud to announce over 40 of our elementary schools have the enriched literacy curriculum. Nine of them are Title I schools. Why is that significant? It's because that means that we have a cohort of children that really needed dedicated enriched accelerated programming and we put it directly into their school. So we're seeing a growth of that. We started with just two, we're now up to nine and more to come in the future, okay? So I wanna turn us back to, again, our progression of how we have attempted to change the trajectory of our students, uh, of the story of our students in Title I schools by providing multiple program opportunities uh, for students to ensure that one, that they have equitable access to enriched programming and order and also that they have access to information about enriched programming in the school system so that families are informed and can advocate for their students and that students are prepared uh, for said programs when the uh, occasion occurs. Okay. Now I'm going to pivot. So I just want to see uh, Ms. Mandrowski if it makes sense that we take a, a small pause here to see if there's any specific questions regarding sure. this portion be before we move to the twice exceptional presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Ladies, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, slide eight. Um, the identification in Title I schools for 
African Americans is 268, but for Hispanics is 554, and their populations in numbers in the school system are pretty close. But that's almost, well, it's more than twice as many. What is happening there? So we can def. I, I want to look at the numbers of um, of students in Title I schools and the demographics, so we can just come back maybe um, to the to the committee with the demographic breakdowns of it. Because I, I'm actually not sure if the statistics right now actually represent. I think we have um, a higher representation of. Uh, Latino students in our Title I overall schools. But I, I want to be able to do that in proportion to the total demographics of all the, the, the schools. So if I may, I'll, I'd like to come back as a follow-up uh, with that, yeah, with those numbers. Yeah, I was numbers. looking at the total population uh, in reference to that, but um, that's an interesting thing if the African-American students are yeah. a lower number in there. I, I don't understand that either. Thanks. Um, Along the same lines, the non-farms African American and Hispanic are lower. Is that because they're not getting these interventions at their neighborhood schools? They're not in Title I schools necessarily? Well, that's or? what I was going to ask. Are these all Title just This is just yeah, Title I information. Title I. So everybody in here is in a Title I school. Yeah. So why would that be lower, you think? <clears throat> it could be due to the percentage of non-farms students in the Title I schools. Because most of our, ti our Title I schools begin at 67.4, I think, or 64.7 and higher farms rate. So there's already that lower, okay. there are very few number of, okay. of students that are non-farms. And I'm assuming we are monitoring every schools, not just the Title I's? Or that is correct. Okay. So the 0.5 uh, person that helps with this implementation, that's for the whole school? That is correct. Mm -hmm. um, Not just Title I. No, they Title just I. work in Title I, but they also work in conjunction with the GT liaison, and in some cases oh. those are two different people. And so they're also partnering with them. They also partner with their staff development teacher to provide some of the professional learning and support, as well as the math content coach or rep and reading specialist. But it is a 0.5 additional position in just Title I schools to do that work. Got it. And um, do any of these schools uh, are currently implementing the new curriculum, and how does that work together? You mentioned uh, junior grade books and other resources, mm -hmm. but how is it? That is correct. So some of our schools are benchmark advanced schools. Some of our schools are Eureka math schools. The primary town development modules that come with our program are interchangeable. So a lot of the strategies that we introduce um, that are concept, concept attainment strategies are applicable to those programs. Um, AEI, Accelerated Enriched Instruction, has also worked with the um, elementary and integrated team to develop a guide that also tells schools if they are using those supplemental resources how to use them within the curriculum resource and so that's something that we have shared with our primary talent development coaches because we want to ensure that we continue to infuse some of those experiences for students okay. that demonstrate that need um, and the you mentioned it's title one funds that uh, fund these positions so it's pretty stable are we can we count on this to continue in the next few years? Yes, we just sent the board, or I believe we're about to send the board. <laughs> I'm actually ahead of time. You will be receiving um, <laughs> an update on Title I, um, and you will see a slight increase in the number of Title I schools for the upcoming year. Oh, gotcha. And we have done all that um, financial projections based on continuing to provide every school with currently what they have. So even if we expanded more Title I schools, that would take into account the need for continuing in all those schools, the 0.5 town development um, support. And so we've done that uh, long-term planning. With Title I dollars, we, we tend to do uh, sort of a two and three year view. Even though we get funding um, reviewed every year, we kind of have a sense of where we are, so we do multi-year planning. And what does the implicit bias work look like in this context? It's a great question. So we work with the equity unit. We've talked about recognizing one's own cultural self in the work. We've talked about our learning behaviors. For a perfect example is inquisitiveness. 
um, oftentimes that looks different um, across students and then how a teacher mm -hmm. receives it. Uh, we've had teachers like in the first year really uh, challenged a bit with students that were once deemed as disruptive because they're constantly impulsive and asking questions all the time. And we've worked with the coach to understand where do we see um, the student's intent? Um, how does our own cultural self influence how we interpret a student's actions and we've also spent a lot of time working on what exactly are these learning skills and what do they really tell us about the student's need. I think the piece about communicative is really important. Um, we've observed the instruction and one of the tasks calls for students to interview a person and so some of the students, uh, kindergarten was really um, precious, some of the kindergartners did not, um, were not fluent in English at the time and the teacher was able to translate in Spanish and they were asking questions and she turned to translate to the teacher saying I cannot believe you know I can't believe these questions that we're asking the key here is to talk about the communicative and inquisitive behavior the key was not whether or not they understood English or were able to communicate in English and so the teacher was able to look and say I didn't think about you know how I approached this lesson before I need to look at this differently now that's the hallmark of primary talent development, looking at instruction differently, getting down to the core of the concept um, and going beyond just looking at the standard. How are different entry points for students to demonstrate their understanding? And I think that's been a lot of the equity work as well, um, helping students and teachers to see different ways of demonstrating understanding. Is this happening as whole school professional development or teacher to teacher? So the primary talent development coach um, is expected to sit on the leadership team and so that, that way the whole school benefits from that. And even though it's K to two, we're talking three, four, and five also benefit from this experience as well. And we talk about enrichment and um, opportunities to expand or, or allow the children to see themselves in the work, in the, in the instructional resources, in the material. It's really a whole school conversation. And we're very very fortunate that our Title I principals are huge advocates of this work. They are constantly asking, you know, for more allocations mm -hmm. and, and whatnot because it's so important um, to, to the whole landscape of the school. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else, Dr. Daka? You good? Um, no, I'm glad you asked about implicit yeah, uh, bias because the explanation was really helpful mm -hmm. and uh, inquisitiveness and these are the kinds of things that cause students to be suspended. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking to see that uh, <coughs> along the way that will reduce some of the suspensions because there's an understanding of the behaviors of the students uh, starting early. And, you know, to close us out on this, I think one of the huge components <coughs> in our learning when we were meeting and talking about this with Krishana's staff and, and, and um, other folks and Nikki Hazel's staff around this, um, it's the parent engagement component, how much work we have to do to support families through this. Lori Christina was in my office at the time, and how we really needed to devote resources and time around the wraparound of a whole family mm -hmm. to work them through sometimes what can be a very complicated system <laughs> of choices and opportunities. Uh, so there's been a lot of really good lessons learned for us as how we approach families in these situations. where We pull up the data and we can see some kids pop out immediately. Mm -hmm. The question for us is how do we go to those and create networks of trust, work with the schools very closely. We are, I mean, I would say that the Title I principles as a cohort is a very tight community around this concept of really working with families who trust them mm -hmm. on making decisions as they move forward. So those are just components that are interesting. Krishana's office monitors uh, what that then means as kids move on in the upper elementary and then middle school grades. Uh, when we come back to the full board to discuss all of the choice programs, uh, we will again touch on some of these topics as you see um, data on uh, uh, options and, ch and where our students are opting to go and what they're opting to take um, advantage of. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I think that um, it'd be helpful when you do that to give us the breakdowns that you're going to provide yeah. as follow-ups here. Um, and I just, I men you mentioned the, um, as they continue on, and that was actually going to be my question, is about how are we working with these families to make sure that they are continuing on a GT, uh, gifted and talented uh, pathway moving to middle and high school? 
One of the things I neglected to, to mention in ELO staff, um, one of the first pieces there, we offer a parent showcase. Um, and, and that is probably the best part of the summer for every single party involved, including um, principals as well. Because we invite families to come in and watch their students facilitate their own showcase. Think of it as a science fair or an exhibition of the students showing their families their work and what they've been studying for those five weeks. We also take advantage of the opportunity to share some information about, well, here are some other opportunities in the district that also provide enrichment in your school and outside of your school. Um, our, our ELO step teachers provide newsletters to our families just so that they're, keep abreast, they're kept abreast of some of these activities and experiences. And so one of the things that we also do with the primary talent development coaches is to ensure when <coughs> magnet season opens up, that we share that information okay. with them. Because uh, as Dr. Navarro said, a lot of these schools do parent coffees, and they have those more intimate school conversations. Now enrichment is one of the topics, you know, which is very important because it's a familiar place for families. Uh, I just had a question about reaching the families, and you, you've mentioned some things that they do, but families who can't come in during the day mm -hmm. do we reach them in the evening and do we go to their homes or their party rooms yeah, or no. whatever absolutely one of the ways um is i mentioned the newsletters and things the website um primary talent development coaches have talked about connect ed messages um i think we can do more you know there are more ways to explore how do we get into the local rec center or your places of worship um, I know I'm a Boy Scout leader that's another opportunity right there you know how are we getting into some of these other activities and sharing information so we're constantly exploring what are additional ways um, to do that thank you. yeah we still have work to do but thank you hopefully our text messaging communication system yeah. will help some to some extent mm -hmm. so Oh, if no other questions, did you? Great, my Brasco. So we're going to move forward um, to the second part, and that is how we support our twice exceptional students. Uh, and so I'm, I think I'm pitching it. Oh, to Phil. Well, I can't oh, you're going to start. I can't get off okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get us started. So here's another um, aspect of our gifted and talented programming, and and one of these pieces which is really near and dear to our heart, is another population of students who've traditionally been underserved or underrepresented in our gifted programming. Mm -hmm. And this is our twice ex exceptional um, program. And we have multiple <laughs> service models. You know, so our students are served, well, first off, our students demonstrate cognitive ability with co-occurring co -occurring disabilities. And so we serve them in multiple models. We serve them in the local school, the least restrictive environment. We serve them in uh, discrete programming. We serve them in a model where there may be in other special education programs. One of the things that you'll hear about later on is just how AEI has even developed curriculum for some of these programs to ensure we honor the gifted portion of the aspect of our program. So really quickly, here's a snapshot of our children in our school system. We have approximately uh, 3,300 students identified as twice exceptional. And if you look on the left-hand side in our three different bands, elementary, about 12% of our twice exceptional students have an IEP. In middle school, roughly 9%. In high school, almost 14% of our students have IEPs. And on the other side, you'll see our students who, are, who have a 504 plan. And again, elementary, you have about 13%. Middle school, almost 19%. High school, roughly 33% of our students. Here's more discrete numbers for you, just to give you context as to what those percentages really mean. This is just within a GTLD program, so it doesn't encompass all of the children. The numbers at the top tell us all of the uh, students. Most of our students are served in the local schools, and I will tell you, in elementary school and in middle school, with the expansion of enriched literacy and enriched courses, that's where a number of our children are being served, and, and we're pleased with that. <coughs> So now um, Phil is going to talk to us about our discrete programs. So as Krishana mentioned, you know, our goal um, would be to serve students in the, the least restrictive environment. And we're serving the majority of those students um, who are identified as twice exceptional 
in their uh, homeschool setting. And, you know, she's using a, a, a broader definition of twice exceptional than just uh, students who have been identified um, as, uh, as eligible for special education services. So she's including kind of a broader, a broader group there. Um, for students to be served in what she re referenced as discrete programs, so these would be students for whom an IEP team meeting has been held, and through that IEP process, it's been ter determined that a student may need um, more restrictive services outside of their home school, and that's a small percentage, a very small percentage of those students. And so at the elementary level, uh, the discrete program is at Barnsley um, Elementary School. You see their logo up there. And they, uh, it is the one school that serves uh, the, the, the system. There are roughly 30 students in that program at Barnsley. And for, uh, for those students, again, it would have been, um, there would have been a rationale through the IEP process that would have said they need to be served in, uh, in a more discreet setting. And so that setting at Barnsley looks like opportunities for inclusion, but receiving services in some smaller self-contained classes for those core academics. They're gonna look at every student individually, so, so each student's schedule in terms of how much time they're spending in the self-contained settings and, and outside may look a little differently, but that's grades three through five for roughly um, 30 students. And so one, some of the things that, make that makes that program um, unique is that uh, we are providing enriched literacy program for, for those uh, students, and that's uh, supported um, directly through, uh, through uh, Krishana's office. Um, they also support the professional development and training and the curriculum planning for those teachers and paraeducators who support those students. They may be receiving services through depending on the setting that they're in at a given time of the day by a special education teacher and paraeducator who have gone through that training um, when they're out in the general education uh, environment they may re be receiving services through general education um, service providers so that's the uh, the elementary program at Barnsley uh, and again that would be through the IEP process and there's roughly 30 students we've been uh, we're also, as we go through this, we're going to talk a little about uh, some of the su supports we've been providing to our, our programs, and we've had um, a collaborative process across our three offices, and Sarah's going to talk a little about the collaboration between our offices to support that program. So, so good, good morning. Good morning. Um, so I supervise the Barnsley, and so any time that a, a special program of any nature is located inside of a comprehensive school, my office is really involved in helping the school leadership, particularly the principal, steward that work with excellence. And so um, there are a lot of skills and dispositions that a leader needs to have, regardless of what program is located in your building. But I would say that the standard for, for content knowledge, understanding special education services, and the ability to work with families is at a pretty high level uh, at Barnsley in terms of needing to have um, you know, great, a great sense of how to integrate lots of different pieces and access all of us. So my role as the director is to coordinate that work. Um, last spring, uh, we came together as a team. I uh, invited uh, Ms. Dean and Mr. Lynch as partners to work with me more directly as, as I worked with the school so that we could really reduce any silo effect of us each kind of working on our own on one, any one aspect of the program. And it's been quite um, positive and very productive. Um, we have been, we meet quarterly. Uh, we've had a number of meetings this year. I think we just met, was it about a week ago? Um, and we meet including the building principal. And we often will also have Miss Sarah Jackson, who is an instructional specialist that works with Miss Dean, who specializes in accelerated and enriched instruction. So we meet and we meet with the principal and we talk about kind of the operation of the program. We look at um, staffing. We look at the skill set of the, of the teachers. We talk about um, any issues or interests that have come up in working with our families. Um, we also really then look at kind of systematic programming. So for in ex as an example, this year we shifted from a kind of grade level distinct approach in the Barnsley program, which was there was a third grade classroom, a fourth grade classroom, and a fifth grade classroom to a departmentalized approach. And so that kind of nimbleness that we try to have across um, our three offices and making sure that we're talking with the school-based leadership and saying, so what's working and how we're running the program, where are the places that we might want to refine or pay attention to, is a collaborative effort. I rely on my partners for their expertise, um, and we really, I think, work very well together 
and bringing excellence to the program. We are also introducing new this year a parent survey that is specific to families being served at Barnsley. Um, and so that survey is going to be rolled out later this month to get their feedback because we want to make sure that this cross office collaboration is ultimately resulting in a positive experience for families as well as addressing any of the needs that the students have. And so we've done some pretty heavy lifting there over the last 12 months and we want to kind of touch base with our families, our primary clients and our students and see whether this collaboration has, has really supported their experience and ultimately the success of their children. So I'm going to shift to um, the middle school program, and I'll just start by saying that you know we referenced the 30 students at the elementary level, and it's not a given that those 30 students would then continue to transition on to receive the same services at the middle school level. Uh, you know, when students are making a transition from elementary to middle school, uh, all students you know go through the annual review process where their where uh, their IP um, is discussed and their needs are, are are considered, and there's always a a look for students who are receiving services outside of the home school to determine whether they can be served back in their home school and so some of those students would would return to their home middle school or their home feeder pattern some school students may continue on to receive um, the the services through the gtld discrete program if it's continued if it's considered to be appropriate and then we would have some new students who would who may have been served in their home elementary school who may be struggling for whatever reasons and an IEP meeting would be determined to say they're going to start receiving services in the middle school so the middle school it's not it's not a, a, a one path you know once you're there you continue on it's always considered every year but just note that at the middle school level which the number bumps up to roughly 50 students uh, just under 50 students um, at three different sites um, those students are coming from different directions. So some of them could be continuing on and some of them may be new to th those services. So the three sites are North Bethesda Middle <coughs> School, uh, Lee Middle School, and, um, and uh, Roberto Clemente Middle School. The model at the middle school looks a little different. It's more inclusive. Um, <coughs> it is more what I would call a resource model. Um, so those students have uh, have a, a resource uh, classroom that is um, designed to meet their specific needs, but they're being primarily supported and served in the general education classrooms with staffing that is provided um, and is provided training to support those um, those students as they're receiving instruction in the general education setting. Uh, some unique things about the middle school um, last year um, under Sarah Jackson's work with the schools they they started to uh, implement uh, opportunities for what they call a passion project which it which would take place uh, within the resource classroom and it's an opportunity for those students to really target an area of interest and to work on a project that really is is focused around something that you know they feel passionate about and that would be facilitated through that through that unique resource classroom as well as working on the types of skills that uh, we generally see that population of students needing specifically things like executive functioning and we also know that writing is a is often a challenge for for students who um, who meet those needs can I interrupt you for one minute certainly and just um, ask you a quick question so they are coming out of an elementary program where they are um, individually served I, I'm not sure what the, I don't want to say secluded because mm -hmm. they're not secluded but they're more self-contained self-contained thank mm -hmm. you that was the word I was looking for um, and then they're moving to a middle school um, program that actually only has it's just one classroom now if they are a, some a student who part of the reason that they're in this type of program is because they don't do well with um, a lot of kids and, and big classroom settings mm -hmm. Do they stay in the resource class the whole day, just that resource classroom the whole day, and their work's brought to them, or do they go to a different school? So the resource class would never be beyond one period, um, so it would, they would not stay in there for the, for the whole day. Some schools, depending on the population of the students, may have self-contained course opportunities for their special education students in general. So let's say there's a group of students that um, there is a need based on the data that's been reviewed um, for there to be a self-contained uh, math course just based on the data and so it wouldn't be specific to the GTLD students but it may be an op uh, uh, maybe something that's appropriate for a group of students at that school so those students may access that smaller classroom if that is determined to be appropriate for a group of students in that school setting 
but in terms of the way that the, the services are structured, the the supports from this uh, program would either go to that self-contained class that would be designed for any students with special needs who need that smaller setting or in the general education setting. Do each of our middle schools have one of those type of programs? Have the other self-contained mm -hmm. classes? I could take a look at that. I haven't looked at whether they offer, what their course offerings are for the outside of the GTLD options, but I could look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would assume it still would mm -hmm. be part of the GTLD um, programming. It would just be in a small classroom setting, a self-contained self-classroom setting. But My I point just is didn't know there, if we had any there of those. other students with disabilities um, who don't carry that designation for whom that course may have been oh, okay. structured for, and it would be then a mix of students. And this may actually also occur, correct me if I'm wrong, at the high school level, because it also, well, like, let's just take a math next. sequence. We mm -hmm. may have some students that um, have an IEP, maybe taking a certain course with students who may be younger than them that are ready to take that math course and may have some similar needs that may equate to that. But I think the, the point is that they got, with specifically looking at students with IEPs, have to, we have to look at each individual case and, and then the schools have to make that determination. But I think we can take a look at that because when we talk about the high schools, uh, and I know you're gonna talk about the high school programs, mm -hmm. I, when I visited one of the high school sites, um, I think with Mr. Lowndes, we talked a lot with the principal and there's the RITC around special accommodations for students. And they house both students that are twice exceptional as well as students who have an IEP. Mm -hmm. And they had to make some accommodations. And I think we had a conversation even around the world languages uh, and some of the needs mm -hmm. that, they, that they thought about and looked at differently. So we can definitely come back and, and mm -hmm. give you more details around how schools are constantly thinking about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I just, I, and I worry because if it's a low, if they're very low numbers, they're not going to do, I understand you're saying it doesn't necessarily have to be a GTLD student, it could be anybody with an IP who needs a smaller classroom setting, and they would pull them all together, mm -hmm. which I appreciate, but if it's a very low number and they're not going to do that, you know, maybe even we need to be looking at, can they be sent to the high school and taught the middle school curriculum or something in that smaller setting, because I just, I struggle with this a lot, so. I'll let you continue. So at the high school level, it, oh, sorry, 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 go ahead, Dr. Dr. at the high school level, the model is very similar, and you know it becomes uh, as students as students age up, it becomes more and more difficult to offer those small self-contained options and all the different course um, course uh, load that this that the school off the, the students would need in order to receive those credits. And it's our goal to to serve students in the general education setting as much as possible. And we have to remember that these are students that you know are well on the way to receiving a diploma. It's been determined that they need certain types of supports in order to be successful. I think I mentioned those two key areas around executive functioning and writing. Those are often patterns, and so the resource model would apply also <laughs> to the high school. And then, and then as Dr. Navarro mentioned, you know we would look for ways to get staff within those classes to support students um, with their needs. And sometimes that can mean you know, taking uh, uh, pieces that, of the curriculum that they're struggling on within those general education classes and then taking that back to the resource class and supporting them through that process, whether it, it, they need um, specifically designed instruction to get through that in the resource class or they need additional time to get through those pieces. But that case manager, which also would be through the, uh, the GTLD services, is a case manager that has been, you know, trained and supported um, uh, by our offices and somebody that is really helping to kind of shepherd those students through those through those courses. But that as well at the high school level is primarily an inclusive model with the um, resource uh, classroom. Dr. Daka, did you? Yeah, I'm back to the numbers again. Slide 11, um, I know that you talked about middle school, but the numbers go down from elementary school and then go back up again in high school on the it's at the IEP side, IEP side, and kind of the same thing happens on the 504 side. So I'm not sure I understand that. The numbers that we have in terms of students with disabilities rank, go from uh, currently 30 students, and if we're talking about students in the discrete programs, it goes about 30 to, to roughly 50, and then just under 80 for the students that are receiving those services in the discrete programs. 
So just a reminder, middle school is three grades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Elementary school is actually, if you start with pre-K, it's six grades. And a lot of identification of students may not happen until later on. So I'm actually not surprised with Mm -hmm. the the breakdown, Dr. Daka, because again, middle school is just three grades. Mm -hmm. And then the high school numbers are the cumulative effect of, of students coming in and potentially new ones as well. Well, okay. Yeah, the snapshot also shows 77 in high school, and I know you're saying that general staff works with some of these yeah. students, and they're not in the most restricted environment. Okay, thanks. So I'm a, can I assume that since you didn't mention how many sites, or how many students were included in how many sites, that we don't actually have any sites, it's just everybody's at their home school? For high school, I'm sorry. For high school? Mm-hmm. No, we have we have um, specific sites. So the three high school sites, we do the same thing that we do in the middle schools with supports. Um, we will have, and this is a good question, I think we will we we can have students that are twice exceptional attend their local high school, mm-hmm. um, and I think that is similar to what we talked about in elementary schools, where we see a lot more of those students attending their elementary options. Remember that high schools offer a lot of different levels of coursework. Uh, And part of the trickiness is to be able to accommodate um, students when they're across 25 high schools and need services versus um, centralizing those into programs. So we actually have a little bit of both. We have special programs in three schools, specific programs, discrete programs in three schools. But we also have to service students that want to remain in their local in their local school. And which where are the schools located for the high schools? So the high schools are, are Watkins Mill High School, Walter Johnson High School, and uh, and Northwood High School. So I should have known I supervised that one. <laughs> and Northwood High School. And so and one one of the things we see happen at the high school is that there may be, you know, students um, with, with needs that are at the high school that had not been identified earlier but then they're 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 at that school and and through their IEP process um, they, they feel like uh, they would benefit from those services and so then they are supported through the through those GTLD services as well but so other than a resource class which don't all kids get resource classes so yeah. resource could be one of the options for any <laughs> student with a, with an IEP. Mm-hmm. This is a resource class with a case manager that, like I said before, is specifically you know, designated to support that population of students and receiving that training. And then the case manager, who's a teacher, as well as paraeducator support that has those trainings would be providing those supports in the general education setting. And again, it is our goal to try to serve students in the general education setting as much as possible and this is a population of students uh, for whom you know the, they're the to, to to have a rationale for them to be removed from the general education setting it should be a very small number of students i think just to elaborate i'll give you a very just clear example when i think about uh, colonel ebrook lee middle school so when you go into the resource classroom where the gtld students are receiving support Uh, many of the students and this is where the the profile of them is that they're quite capable of mastering grade level or advanced curriculum but they may have features of their um, special education needs many of which have to do with executive functioning the ability to stay organized you know all of those demands that are um, increased when you're in middle school for the first time often Mm -hmm. and so a lot of times what you see is the case manager will lead them through quarterly enrichment projects so there isn't an it's not just that they're there helping them with the work of their other classes they're actually providing them with an enriched experience but then as the case manager they're also ensuring that all of the other teachers who are supporting and working with that child are aware of the needs are differentiating assignments in order to make sure that they can demonstrate mastery kids because because the students are very bright and we don't want to lose that gifted part of the pro- profile. And so uh, many times they're um, brainstorming different organizational tools and strategies and working with families to figure out how to help 
really prepare the kids for independence and managing all of the different things that are happening for them. So it's a little bit different than a traditional resource class. Um, I started my career 20 years ago working in that at Walter Johnson. There's actually an instructional component and a very significant case management component to ensure that their challenges with attention and organization, perhaps um, written expression, do not impact their ability to access or demonstrate their learning. Could you say again how students are supported if they are in their neighborhood high school with this service? So we, we, uh, we, we implement what we call a console model where you know, if, a, if a student is identified that um, would require that type of support, um, we, that's where Sarah Jackson, our instructional specialist, who, um, who actually, it's a great partnership. Uh, she, maybe it drives her a little crazy, but she, you know, cause she, li but she lives in the curriculum office, but she does have regular items with me and, and we do work closely together. It's a good collaboration. Um, so she, li she, she has one foot in both worlds, but um, she does uh, a lot of support with in individual teachers through the consult process to say, you know, what can we do within this specific course or set of courses to support this student um, so that they're, you know, accessing enriched in instruction to keep them, uh, keep their level of interest uh, peaked, but also to support their challenges. So what is it in terms of the way the material can be delivered um, in terms of the product process and products that we're asking students to produce? Um, it may require teachers to look at things uh, differently or more flexibly in terms of the way that they're uh, assessing students. Um, and so uh, we do that through a consult model. That's one piece. Um, and so that's the primary uh, way that we provide that, that support to students who are in their home settings. And a teacher would have to request this support or, I mean, and, and what are the numbers system-wide that are getting, that need this support yeah. at the high school? And are they put in a magnet program if they're, if they're gifted <laughs> aspect So they could or? be in it. They could be in a magnet program. It could be, it could be in a multi, it could be in multiple settings. Um, <laughs> The numbers essentially you heard me talk about the students who you know who are in the discrete programs which which are roughly 162 students mm -hmm. um, that are that are for whom they've gone through the IEP process and it's been determined that they they need to receive those services outside of their home setting if we subtract those 162 students from that larger number um, that Ms. Dean shared then that would be your that would be your number which was that larger number That's what I'm So when you look at the broader, she said 3,351 students, but she's using a broader definition of students that would also include students with 504, not just IEPs. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if you would like, we can do a follow-up um, to give you what that number is, the breakdown by high school, uh, because you just met, we, Phil just mentioned the staff member that does the sort of case management for everybody else and just how are the students doing in those in their home settings in their home high school so mm -hmm. we can do that as a follow-up I just think it's important to talk about both because mm -hmm. obviously the numbers are yep. even greater in the mm -hmm. in the home schools so we have one more slide if we may mm -hmm. um, that talks a little bit about some of the things that have been queued up around social emotional learning um, so this year, oh, thank you. <laughs> For this year in the elementary program, we adopted a social emotional curriculum to complement our enriched uh, literacy curriculum for grades three through five. And this was important because as you can see, some of the tenets that we work with with some of the students, self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. As we continue to help foster that independence, we wanted to be very um, explicit about using a curriculum to support our students. And in middle school, we're engaging our students in the Be Well 365 um, program. And so that piece is very important also, again, to address some of the tenants that I just shared with you. We're currently right now reviewing the current practices um, and resources that are currently in place in high school to determine if there needs to be a different recommendation made for them as well. So that piece is equally important as our academic curriculum um, for how we serve our students. This piece here, um, a lot of our parents did talk about this need, you know, for really addressing the other side of the student. And so we made sure to explicitly bring that into our, our program um, this year with a focus as well. 
So that actually concludes our portion. If there are any additional questions. I just want to make one quick uh, note, too, about the integration of work. So you, you see here three departments within central office represented, talking back and forth around the, the braiding of the word, of the work. Um, I'll give you another example that I think is just important to note. So our summer programs and our, you heard about the Title I summer program specifically for our gifted um, students and the way we try to find students, support them, support their families. Uh, and we talked around students who have IEPs and, and one of the things that we had done sort of um, in siloed was how we approach our summer programming and one of the things that the two that the offices are doing this summer is bringing together our students to the same building so they have uh, experiences together our extended school year programs coming out of special education and our elementary summer programs that happen it's important that they happen together that way staff can be exposed to and see kids in uh, learning environments where they are together, learning together. Um, and I think that will only increase our awareness, our, um, you know, we put staff in, in places and with students that maybe they don't experience during the school year. And so just that awareness of students allows also for some professional development to take root and see it in action as you support more, um, you know, more programs coming together rather than being in different facilities and, and in places. And, and that's an important piece. That's a lot of what has mobilized, I think, in the conversation around twice exceptional students. Um, it has mobilized staff to work collaboratively together because they're going to have students in their classrooms at one point or another. And, and, and that's the importance of capacity building. Um, so I just wanted to make a point about that. Do we, you got, do you want to go ahead? Okay. Do we, um, do surveys every year of the families and I I know that as uh, someone who's I'm experienced with not just special education but this particular programs um, they'll send out a mailing thing but how are we actually making sure that you hear back from every family because we have a very low participation rate generally um, of these type of things and I want to know so how we're there are a couple of different instruments and some of them are broad and some of them are more narrow and so we you know uh, we have a f through special education we have two surveys one is um done through this uh, through the state of maryland so each parent who has a student uh, with a disability in the state of maryland receives a, a mailing and we have online opportunities for them to complete the survey as well and they can provide specific information through their comments we receive the state gives us back all of the comments um uh that that parents make so there's that broader special education state survey. And then we also have a survey um, that we have started to implement. And I think you all are familiar with the um, survey that, because uh, I think it was your decision to take it system-wide, um, where we uh, survey parents after IEP meetings and after the IEP process. Um, and so that's something that um, is happening um, at the school level. And so, you know, we're in, the, we're in the process of looking at what schools are getting us good numbers from those surveys and talking to schools that um, we need to get more feedback from. What do you consider good response, percentage-wise? Percentage-wise from parents that are attending? The, well, I'm the saying you IEP. said you'll talk to mm -hmm. schools that aren't getting mm -hmm. um, enough feedback. So what what kind of, what is enough, if you don't mind my asking? Is it 3% of a response level? Is it 13%? Is it 65%? <laughs> I mean, I would love to see at least half of our parents respond. I mean, you can share with you know you could share with parents an opportunity to do it not all of them will take the opportunity but i mean it would love be great at that at that individual school level that we we see a higher rate so i mean it would be great for you know for half of those parents to respond um, to those surveys if they were given the opportunity to follow up after meetings so i just want to point that that survey came out of the audit mm -hmm. that was done in special education about three years ago right. that said mm -hmm. that parent engagement and think of ways of opportunities um, so part of, and I think uh, Sarah will probably talk to this a little bit more, part of, it, of us is collecting the data because the, the point of the survey, if, if I'm remembering correctly, was to do it right after you come out of an IEP meeting. Right. And that is, you know, sometimes there's a lot of um, discussions and emotions and so forth, but we decided as a district that we wanted to capture that as a point in time and as an important data indicator for how families were feeling like they were able to convey um, 
their points of view, that they were listened to, that they were part of that environment. Uh, we do have some families that say, no, thank you, not right now. And we have uh, watched that carefully, not to be overly sort of uh, following, you know, somebody mm -hmm. following you say, no, you must, you can't leave until you do this, just because sometimes the conversations go great and sometimes they're tough conversations to, mm -hmm. to have. I think um, we can definitely um, give you an, an overall view with specific data on what we look like, uh, what we look at now. But part of that is the work between special education and OSSI around looking at that as a point indicator for schools and say, okay, if we are low compared to other middle schools, we are a middle school compared to what other middle schools are, how can we bring our, our numbers up? And then continuously think about what are other engagements by which we can bring that number up. So it is a, I think it's, for us, it's a working data point in progress to understand what families are, um, are saying and um, how they feel represented and, and the families that are engaged in, in this process. What do we do with that data, if you don't mind my asking? You, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you up, but I was just curious because like I know, for example, um, I had a parent reach out about the survey that was done for uh, learning centers um, and are still waiting. And I feel like it's been a couple months uh, or maybe a year um, to get the results from those surveys and so do we post them somewhere or are they put somewhere do we use them to I mean I'm just going to keep rolling with that I try not to make this job too personal but I'm not sure what survey I'm not you happy. I'm not sure, sure what survey you're referencing mm -hmm. that learning center. I'll forward you the the email about the information about it mm -hmm. um but um, I'm very happy to see that we've added a social emotional learning aspect and I'll let my colleagues jump in, but um, I think that there are more families and certainly more parents who might need something or whose students might need something different, but they don't know how to advocate for that. They don't know how to ask for that. They think that they're in the GTLD program continuing on and Really, they're just mainstreamed with a resource class, which even I think my daughter had a fly time, which kind of seemed like the same type of thing as a resource class. Um, you can just go to different teachers instead of being in one specific classroom. But um, but I'm wondering, do we do anything like working with our alternative programs or um, letting parents know that there are other options if they're not really feeling like um, this mainstream only option is good for their kids. So what I'm hearing also is um, wanting to see where we survey, how we survey, and how do we know, and looking at specifically um, getting some information from the families that participate in our twice exceptional programs around their specific feedback on the programs. Um, I think that's something that the schools have instituted. We can definitely come back and think through how we could do that more as a systemic uh, uh, response of, of reviewing that, that data. Sarah, I know you wanted to chat. So I think it's a great question. I always, whenever I talk with principals, I say, whenever you create a survey, be clear why you're collecting it and when you'll get back to people. Mm -hmm. Because we know that if people are gonna take the time. So one of the things that Phil's team has been great, um, particularly, and I'll just speak to Barnsley as an example, is really looking at the degree to which families are taking advantage of the IEP meeting survey. And so seeing that that was not at a high level, working with the principal and the school team to say, we have to make this easier for folks and more clear. Pre-stamp it. Right, right. Just saying. Well, so it's digital. It's digital. <laughs> okay. So we talked about setting up a Chromebook, <laughs> you know, setting up a Chromebook outside of, of a meeting. Mm -hmm. And again, being sensitive to what Dr. Navarro said, um, making sure that, that it's done uh, not as a pro forma, but truly to say, we want to hear what you have to say so that we can get better. The IEP meeting experience is extremely stressful. Yep. Um, and I think it's interesting because as a former principal and now as a parent, you think that the team feels stressed, but the, tr the true audience and person in the room that you have to take care of is the family. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to ask questions so that we can make sure that the family's having a good experience. Um, so the Barnsley survey, 
Um, I th we thought it was important. So we did in-person surveying initially. Mm -hmm. um, we held a, a community meeting um, because, you know, I will say that the, it is not a, a community that lacks um, sophistication and advocacy. And so we were really appreciative to our families, particularly at Varnsley, who were, help were helpful in helping me as the director. And then, of course, Ms. Dean and Mr. Lynch understand what their experience was like. And so we came up with a large list of things that we wanted to tackle. Um, we started last spring. There was some kind of low-hanging fruit that we could address, and then there were some longer-term things that we wanted to look at, this being one of them. So how do we implement that? We're using a wonderful program called It's Not I'm Not Just Gifted, mm -hmm. which is being done every day. And there's a pacing guide, and the teachers like it, and the kids like it. But we said when we met last week, now's a good time to go back and ask families about whether these changes, these shifts based on feedback have really been positive. So the survey is one that we designed together with the principal and said, here are the things that we put in place. Let's ask whether this is working, you know, working well, mm -hmm working but needs some revisions or not working and then we want families to identify for anything that needs revision or isn't working what would a solution look like so we're really trying to have it be problem or solution oriented mm -hmm. not just articulating what isn't working but how could we address this concern for you how could we create this experience the body of work that we've been asking about is primarily around communication around the implementation of this curriculum around opportunities for inclusion we're also asking about, we've had some staffing shifts, and so we're going to ask about those experiences. And so we have a really nice partnership um, with Ali Breen, who's the president of the GTLD network, who really works with us and helps us understand where we need to get tight. Um, and where, where, so last week we had a conversation, I think Mr. Lynch did, about bringing in some additional professional development. Um, and I forgot, what was the topic? Um, Self-regulation, well, it was de-escalation strategies. Mm -hmm. Right. Correct, right. And so, and that's a good example. Um, so, you know, and beyond the survey, you know, we, we, we were, all, were listening to parent feedback in multiple ways, and I think that's what Sarah's referencing too. That community meeting was a great way to do that, and, and the, the three offices represented there. Um, it, it, was a, it was a great collaborative effort. But, you know, the, to answer your question in terms of the, the so what with the survey piece would be, you know, that we would look at that information and then come back and often it might mean doing some type of professional development, whether it means professional development about how to write um, well-aligned IEPs or how to um, how to um, uh, facilitate IEP meetings. Um, we do we do training for um, IEP co-chairs or IEP chairpersons. Um, and so those are the types of professional development and uh, and there is uh, some professional development that's gonna be taking place around this area. Uh, of the social emotional piece and how we, um, you know, how we, how do we uh, interact with students um, who have those types of needs? So that well, I think our elementary school program is amazing. Personally, I'm just wondering those families that you survey at the Barnsley program, which is fabulous. Do you continue with them as they go into middle and high school? The same families to see whether because it's great if they're loving it there, but once they leave, if they don't have anything to go to. That's a problem, and I really am struggling with the fact that we don't offer anywhere for our kids to go to, um, and maybe whether that should be at the alt programs or something else. But it can really, it can push a kid to want to not be in school anymore by the time they're 14 if they don't have the proper services. But um, Ms. Silvestri, Ms. Silvestri, uh, with the survey um, that you conduct after the IEP meetings, are you? I'm assuming you're doing it in multiple languages question and uh, are you hearing any feedback from parents about the usefulness of the translated IEPs that's a good question so we do do the sur we do have the survey available in multiple languages and uh, in terms of the feedback um, around the usefulness of the translated IEPs I'd, I'd, I would um, I would have to look into that I don't we don't have an easy way to collect that information and in that in terms of that way that question is framed mm -hmm. we do have parents that request that the final IEP um, be translated in those top six languages which is something that we we offer and so we do offer that service um, uh, we would need to circle back in terms of that question about the usefulness of it mm -hmm. are people taking advantage of the multilingual surveys they they are um, taking advantage of it um, you know I, I, I we'd have to get back to you on the numbers of, uh, in terms of how much how many folks are requesting that that and my final question is, is everything we talked about here funded through the special ed budget? Is there anything that is not? 
No, there's actually um, the a lot of the curriculum materials um, and some of the professional development is funded through OSIP at where Krishana's office sits. So uh, a lot of it can be funded through, and, and remember Title I, also we talked about Title I, Title I falls under o OSIP mm -hmm. as well. So there's a lot of funding that comes from OSIP. There is a lot of support funding and staffing that is supported through special ed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just wanted to reiterate, one of the pieces from the survey that we learned also, particularly from the elementary program, was that families wanted us to elevate the GT portion of the program, which was paramount. And so actually, last summer, our office developed a curriculum specifically for the program in order to also infuse the pacing guide for social emotional learning. And then the last piece, um, AEI has a feedback council. And that council is made up of parents that represent multiple aspects of the community. This year we made sure to have um, community representation from the Twice Exceptional uh, GTLD Parent Network because we wanted the voice at the table when we talk about GT programming and options. And in turn to also hear about all of the options that are available to family. So I think that's part of the um, outcome of some of the surveys and the parent conversation that we talked about with families um, individually. I just wanted to say I'm glad to hear the notion that you are saying to parents we need to work on this together mm -hmm. because IEP meetings can be very daunting even for professionals who are sitting there and there's so many people around the table but working with parents because we always talk about partnership and I think that's really important. And my last thing is, what does H-I-A-T stand for? I went through these materials. I don't remember <laughs> the definition. Sorry. So that's, that stands for High Incidence Accessible Technology. So we have two groups that help support students, um, special needs students, access technology. Uh, one is called Hyatt, and they would be working with our high incidence students. Those would be students that have learning disabilities. And so what the Hyatt team might do, an example would be to come into a class where a student or multiple students um, who may be having trouble accessing um, the curriculum, um, do an observation and look at what the needs of the students are and then look at what the professional um, development needs of the teacher are as well. And they might say things like, well, this, these types of software or programs would really help this, this group of students access the curriculum. If they were using this type of software, this type of technology, um, th that would really help them. But the teacher doesn't know how to, how to use that. So we'll train the teacher and we'll help make sure that, that, that we have a, pro a process for the student to access that technology in the classroom. So they do a consult and make sure that teachers are trained. And then we have another group that interact with, works with students with significant cognitive disabilities uh, with communication. Thank you. All right, well, um, there's a lot that I feel like I could continue to say. I hope that we are working with the families to make sure, even when you have, you shouldn't have to have an educational advocate hired at an IEP meeting to be able to get services that you need. And I think sometimes we, I worry that we are pushing um, families to kind of just, well, keep going, keep going, it's gonna be okay or whatever. And, um, and we maybe need to, do something different. Um, the only other thing I was going to say is about the stamps thing that it was kind of kidding, but kind of not because the ones that we mail home, if, if you have to go to the post office and get stamps and all that, it, it, it tends to end up in your purse and <laughs> not get mailed. <laughs> so, Ms. Mondrowski, one of the things that I think um, we may want to do is we'll walk away with some of the recommendations from um, the comments of the, of the committee. And then as we meet to plan future agenda topics that maybe we don't lose the discussion around how we support families through the transition of elementary, very tight, um, unique programs. Again, we have a lot of students that are served at, the, at their local schools. Um, and how to get the voice of parents as they transition from elementary, middle, and high, which was brought up today. Um, and looking at how we support sort of that case management of students who are not at discrete programs and are in their schools. How do we know and so forth. So I just want to um, put it on the record that we will follow up with some suggestions and then as we meet for uh, planning future item topics that this continues to be an update with the areas of um, with the recommendations from the feedback from the committee uh, and so that we update continuously and we don't let these topics sort of um, stand still. I very much appreciate that. I mean, very, very much. Like I said, I try not to make this work 
to take it or make it personal, but I still apologize to my son for not fighting harder for him and doing better. And so just hate to see any other families go that route. Um, and with that, we can move on to the next topic. Thank, Thank you, you so all very much, much for coming. Um, so we are going to be transitioning um, to our second topic for today, and that is an update, a system-wide update on our supports um, and our continued work uh, to support our LGBTQ uh, IA students and uh, our families and the community in general. Um, and so I want to invite several staff members to introduce themselves and um, we are going to try to hit a lot of aspects of the system um, covering facilities, covering curriculum, professional development uh, at various levels in the organization. Mm -hmm. I am happy to stop at any point if there are questions or if you want to hear the entire presentation and then uh, specifically target on, on different um, areas of it. So with that, I... Um, Let's get the presentation up. Click. Great. Um, yeah. Uh, keep going. Um, oh. One moment. I'm sorry. That's okay. Great, so I will ask um, staff to introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Good morning, I'm Greg Edmondson, Director of Student Welfare and Compliance in the Office of Chief of Staff. Good morning, Troy Body, Director of Equity Initiatives. Good morning, Siobhan Alexander, Director of Curriculum Implementation, Pre-K to 12. Morning. So um, thank you for the opportunity to share our updates on where we are with this very important work. Um, if you'll allow me, I just want to describe or walk you through, um, before we start with the slides, um, just a 60-second commercial that was just shared with me recently, brand new from a popular coffee shop, <laughs> without saying the name. And um, it portrays a teenager navigating through his day, if you've seen it. Haven't. And it's on the computer, and it says a name and a space, and he's pondering what to write in the space. Uh, doorbell rings, and um, the person delivering the package says Gemma Miller, and he takes the uh, package. Uh, show him at the uh, M or the motor vehicles, and the name on the uh, screen that that he's next is Gemma Miller. And then they, he, they show him panning down to his student university ID, and it says Gemma Miller. And each of these different experiences that they quickly pan into, you can see a, a look of deflated or defeat on, on his face. He shows up at, a, at a, what looks like a birthday party, I'm assuming, with balloons, and Dad introduces, um, you know my Gemma, to friends. Um, and then he goes to the coffee shop and the barista asks for um, a name for the order and he looks at him and says, James. And the barista writes James and he, you see this sense of relief like, that's my name and that's who I am. Um, and it pans out and said, every name's a story on the, on the commercial. And I think I wanted to start with that because that's the why behind this work. We have kids in our schools, if you can translate it over from a coffee commercial to um, students navigating through their day every day, and they, they identify themselves a certain way, or they have a name that they prefer, or a gender that they prefer, and when they're not recognized or valued or identified as that person, it's deflating. And it's, um, you know, it's difficult for, um, us to expect our students to sit in a classroom and be fully engaged in, in, the, in the academic, in the work, when they're navigating, and we're really battling these, um, these challenges. So I wanted to start with that, and it was just shared with me, and I thought that that was a good way to at least set the context for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Regarding where we have been with, with this work and updating you on um, our work in the LGBTQ uh, initiatives and implementation, I mean, personally, I feel like the energy and the strength behind this work has is, is, um, never been stronger. Our communication, if we go to the next slide, oh, I have this, thank you. Um, 
we look at our community um, stakeholders and our, the work that we have been um, engaged in, not only internally but externally, um, has been extremely strong. We have um, open lines of communication. We have a um, identifiable um, um, points of reference for our external stakeholders to be able to um, ask questions and to get information from different areas like curriculum or the um, equity unit or from our, our student family support office, engagement office. And we're strengthening and working on our policies and our guidelines each day. Now, student welfare and compliance, I mean, I see us as our number one role is implementing and ensuring the quality control around ACA, which is non-discrimination, equity, and cultural proficiency. So that covers a, a lot of different areas. And this, of course, is one of those important areas of um, ensuring that there's um, non-discrimination within our LGBTQ and our gender um, identity, um, gender norms and our gender identity um, students. So we've enhanced our professional development. We've targeted um, supports through our families, such as parent, um, implementing a parent academy this fall from um, the Office of Student and Family Support and Engagement. We've initiated um, enhancements to our core curriculum, which we're going to share with you in just a moment. And we, um, to see it a little bit different as a timeline, um, we are building off of the forum that was held last May at Wooten, uh, which was a really a, a big step to bring in our community together with our school district and moving forward for the for the focus and for the um, the, uh, the sending the message that this is a big part of what we want to um, do within our school system. Um, Dr. Navarro wonderfully appeared on the uh, Kojo Namdi show in August and highlighted the, this work and received, we received great feedback from that um, conversation that was on the radio. We started out the year, we implemented, and we have imp currently an implementation team, which consists of stakeholders from each of our offices, and as well as external stakeholders to um, the MCC PTA LGBTQ committee uh, leads, as well as other stakeholders, to really map out where we are going with this work um, and how we are um, building on the professional development that's needed with our staff, with our employees, with our, um, with our schools, our teachers, what this means in their classrooms. Um, we've um, updated our, our senior leadership and our superintendent regularly on this work and what the next steps are going to be. Um, providing them with updates of content as well to make sure we're all on the same page with um, even terms and definitions. October 1st, and if to reference back to the commercial about the student, the uh, teenager being in the uh, Motor Vehicles Administration, um, October 1st, Maryland did um, start or implemented the, um, the X marker for driver's license. So somebody who's applied for a driver's license can mark male, female, or non-binary X. And we um, expanded that to the district as well, where a student can enroll in our system as male, female, or X non-binary. And we've trained all of our record keepers and all of our attendance secretaries on what that means and what, um, what is needed to be done in order for that to happen. We've uh, retrained our, our student um, welfare liaisons in all of our schools to make sure they understand the process. Our counselors have all been trained. When a student does come and say, I identify myself differently than how I'm registered or how I am enrolled. Um, and we've also started collecting that data this year, with, with mean, which means we used to have um, students submit the form, which we have a specific form for preferred name and preferred gender that they complete with their counselors. And we are collecting those in our office in, in order to, to organize the data in order to better make some decisions about the supports needed in our schools. We've received 33 of those this year, 15 from the high school, 15 from the middle school, three from our elementary schools. Um, and continuing to um, make sure again, like everybody is, that everybody is on page with the work that we're doing. I mentioned the driver's license and the X marker that we're doing with our non-binary um, 
students. Our compliance training with our gender, um, student gender identity is being, is in the process right now of, of being updated with these changes for our next uh, series of compliance trainings that our office, um, again, it's a cross, cross office, uh, school system wide um, compliance effort, but um, we're you know, leading and um, pulling everybody together to make sure that this is what we need and how it's um, articulated. Um, and uh, really making sure that um, all of our school, I mean, one of the most important pieces of this work is, is when they're in the classrooms and they can meet with their counselor and fill out these forms, but what, what is the experience that mm -hmm. they are um, having in the classrooms? Um, doing strong work with our GSAs, which is our, um, our Gender Sexuality Alliance group. So each, it's a club at the high school or at the middle school that we have um, up and running in all of our schools. All of our schools except for six, we're still in development with six of our middle schools. But we're working with um, our outside partners and external partners um, to, uh, to bring in a group from, called SMILE, which is pro providing training to our um, GSA sponsors so that they are able to really develop meaningful, I, think, I know Candace is in the, uh, in the audience here, and she's working <laughs> with Kathy, our specialist, to really enhance this professional development for our sponsors. So, um, a lot of great work going on, a lot of energy within the within the district um, along this topic. Mr. Body is just uh, going to update us on the uh, gender neutral facilities work. I, we apologize. We had a, a last minute. Um, flu outbreak in our person from facilities, so oh. he is home taking care of some MCPS kids who can't come to school today. <laughs> uh, so the whole family is, uh, <laughs> is fighting the flu, so Troy uh, updated himself and is going to be discussing this. So there may be some topics that you may ask us for, in all honesty, we that we may have to, to come back yeah. and, and, and ask facilities for more information. Okay. So, you know, just being flexible, I'll, I'll be <laughs> assume the role of Seth right now. But I wanted to just to share some of the updates on gender neutral um, facilities um, and usage. So one of the things that the team has been working on is really moving from single use bathrooms to multi use bathrooms. And to do this is um, they're retrofitting bathrooms with partitions and those kind of things so that multi users can can have access to those facilities. Um, they've really been working on working with stakeholders and balancing that idea of sa um, safety and student experience. Because when we talk to students, they you know want to have feel include, included mm -hmm. and be safe um, as they use facilities. So listening to student voice and their experiences, as well as making sure that we are keeping students safe at all times, is one of the reasons we're migrating from single use to multi um, to multi user bathrooms. Um, so we have older buildings. And just like out in our hallway, they are <laughs> updating the bathrooms. Facilities is going back to retrofit existing facilities as they update bathrooms um, as funding allows. But they're also, upon request, and if there are students um, who request it, um, are going in and making those updates in school facilities where needed as well. So. Again, working with partners um, and looking at student experience. They're also um, examining best practices in terms of what's next in terms of locker rooms. Mm -hmm. So really, that's the next level of work that they are exploring and trying mm -hmm. to figure out what that right combination is. So again, to keep student experiences um, and, um, and included in those spaces, but also examining the idea of um, balancing that idea of safety. So that's what I have for um, for Seth. Um, Are they allowed to um, use staff bathrooms if they if our schools aren't fitted with a bathroom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So schools can make. And those. we tell them that. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the ongoing work is making sure yes. everybody is aware of these things. Um, and that that's just the work that we have to continue to move forward. Yeah, since you mentioned that, they can use health bathrooms as well. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. 
and we've tra and I failed to mention we've trained our principal. We had a big. Um, Oops, sorry. We had an implementation um, training in December for all of our principals and administrators on this work and making sure okay. they understand and have an opportunity to ask questions, as well as call, calling us on a daily basis if they have questions about um, really anything along these lines to make sure that our students um, and our student gender guidelines will be upheld and, and uh, respected. Um, Moving forward, February 15th, we have a, um, a conference coming up called Time to Thrive. It's in DC, it's a nationally known conference, and we're sending 20 of our employees, our, our staff there, to, um, um, for multiple reasons. We wanna be able to learn as much as we can about, um, in, about this work and mm -hmm. hear from our students or many students will be speaking there we want to understand their experiences we also know that um, and to share with you on April 25th we will have our our second LGBTQ forum it will be at uh, Walter Johnson High School on the 25th and we want to take some um, great work and some ideas from time to thrive and see how we can bring it locally to Montgomery County uh, Public Schools and really excited about the team that, that um, Shella Cherry is leading and putting together to make sure that we have that engagement level. Um, Let's make another uh, note about Time to Thrive. Please. So Time to Thrive comes out, and you'll hear a little bit about the different ways in which we are in co uh, we're partnering and, and learning from the Human Rights Campaign, who sponsors Time to Thrive, who sponsors also um, some additional curriculum that we'll talk about that we're looking into and exploring. Um, but not only is there central office, school level staff going, but there's students going on Sunday. So on the 15th, the 14th in the evening, we'll, um, some of us will go for the kickoff. Um, the 15th will be there all day. Um, and on the 16th, the students get to come. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a at least one student from every single high school. And if we couldn't find a student from every single high school, we would uh, bring somebody from the middle schools. Again, uh, it's a lot of registrations and fees, so we wanted to have a, a large representation, uh, but probably continue it to grow because this will be our first time attending, and 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 we may uh, we wanted to really be part of the network of how mm -hmm. school districts are working together and coming together to talk about um, all aspects of this work. Um, so we're definitely wanting to um, learn, as Greg said, uh, and we also want to share our best practices. If there are schools that are further behind in the way that the their school boards developed policies, I think we have this school board has some really strong policy setting. They even have, you know, some noted uh, feedback to the Supreme Court around issues that affect our LGBTQ community. So we have on record a lot of policy um, that discusses this topic and procedures and processes that we hope also could be helpful for schools just entering into this process because those things need to be squared away, that there is sort of that message around where what the school district believes and strives to do so that the operational folks, us on the field and in the schools every day, understand the guiding principles that guide this work. So we are excited to go, but we're also excited that our students get an opportunity to go and also network, mm -hmm. um, because that's an important piece of, of this component. Thank you. Um, all aspects of our um, school district are a part of this work. We've trained all of our um, athletic directors on um, on the work and on the LGBTQ gender identity guidelines. Um, I mentioned Shella Cherry, she and um, a large team working with Dr. Sullivan from athletics are in the process of developing a student-led training for the coming school year on um, bullying and hazing. And you know we're all very aware that um, bullying, hazing, and um, homophobia are tied together quite tightly in many different um, circumstances and instances. So um, really proud of that work and it's coming along um, very well with regards to a, a 2021 school year uh, module or um, student led training for our, for our sports and athletics and extracurricular groups. I, I mentioned the Parent Academy. Um, we've been working with creating safe spaces with LGBTQ students with PFLAG and again I mentioned um, uh, Ms. Haga and the work with PFLAG 
And again, elevating our uh, student voice, not just with Time to Thrive, but we had an opportunity. Um, Troy and his team brought in um, what they call an LGBT forum for student voice and for staff and for parent voice, community voice. And what more than 120, 130 people were at this um, uh, forum in August before school started providing providing the district with some incredible voice data on experiences, not just from a student that perspective, but from a parent of, a, of, a, of an LGBTQ or a transgender child, and what that means for them and how we um, can support our families as much as possible. And our staff, what does that mean for our staff who are LGBTQ, who are um, transgender, and navigating through a teacher who um, you know, was called, let's say, Mr. for years, and comes in over the summer and says, I would like to be um, identified as mix. And what does that mean for the school? And what does that mean for the community? And how do we communicate that? And how do we support our staff in those efforts? Um, it's been a lot of conversations, a lot of work to make sure that um, we're doing this right. Sometimes it's slower than others because we absolutely want to get it right, not just mm -hmm. legally, but respectfully for all involved. Um, and just really working together and making sure that you know each office, each um, aspect of our community is included in this work. And I mentioned um, SMILE is supporting and mentoring youth advocates um, with regards to our GSAs and our schools. We're looking into the research, not just taking you know our word for it and what we think is best, but looking into ADL, um, Anti Defamation League, and the research behind. Um, this work as well as work with hate bias and things that really tie very closely together with each other. And then, very importantly, what does this look like within the content and within the curriculum that we are providing for our students? And so I'll ask that um, Ms. Alexander share that part of it with us. Good morning. Um, we wanted in the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs, um, we have a variety of different components that we're working on as we make a plan moving forward. Um, while the, the items that Mr. Edmondson mentioned about the school community are essential, really to us the next step of the work is how do we ensure that students see themselves represented in their learning. Um, they need a safe place, they need to feel safe to be able to learn, but once they're there, how do we make sure that students feel a part of the curriculum? Um, and so this is kind of the high level, I'll go through each piece of it. Um, we spent a lot of time focusing on ELA curriculum. Um, I'm sure when many of us think of literature that we read, that for many people is a really memorable part of the school experience. And so a lot of work is done to talk about how all students need mirrors and windows, mm -hmm. right? And some you'll even hear say need mirrors, windows, and doors. Mm -hmm. The mirror being reflects back to you so that you feel like you can relate. The window is seeing the world beyond what you experience, and the door is even pushing you to walk through that and expand what you experience. Um, and we know in reality, there are a large number of students who have a lot more windows than they do mirrors in what they say. They don't see their, their families themselves, their lives, their cultures represented. And in OSIP, we have been working to expand that and increase, but we know that for our LGBTQ students and families, it actually has been probably the hardest and really hard to find um, and make a part some of that work. And so we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do. So as you are very aware, we have new curricular products in both elementary and middle school ELA. Um, and so we're working in two ways um, in partnering with our curricular vendors, right? Both curriculum vendors have a library of resources that students can tap into, and then they have the explicit lessons in the curriculum. And so both of our curricular partners have been very willing to work with us in thinking about how to partner moving forward. When you think about uh, vendors who work with communities across the country, there's very different um, opinions and motivations about moving forward and how th what this work looks like. Everything from state mandates saying more to communities that may be resistant. Um, so we have been thrilled that they have been very open to moving forward. Um, the easiest place to move more quickly are with the supplemental resources within the curriculum. So um, StudySync, our middle school curriculum, has a huge library of online resources for students. And so they're working with us to add more books and 
reading resources to those materials. Um, when we think about the core curriculum, um, there are materials that are included, but we're continuing to work with what does that look like. So StudySync, our curriculum, has something called BLASTS. There are current events that students read about to get them excited and relate to their world. And so they had one about some of the pride parades recently. Um, and so we're working with them around how do we, how do we continue that work. Um, when we think about our elementary students, again, Benchmark Education Company has started to create some additional series, one of them about authentic voices, the idea being that they want to ensure that they're not slapping together books, um, but that they are actually written by authors who are authentic and have those experiences. And so they have started with the supplemental materials. Um, and we're convening with them and some of their high-level executives around what over the course of the next few years might we actually do even within the context of the core curriculum, um, the materials that all students would have to continue to think in that way. We know that everything students read is not limited to what they actually get during English class. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking the, the idea of books and literature beyond that, right? So our media centers are a great resource. Um, so one of the first things we're really looking at is collecting an audit, what books are available in media centers. The next step we'll really have to make a decision around is if we want to ensure that every media center has a nice variety, a nice library, so we don't have a single story experience for students, do, what do we do in terms of approving books and making them available? And what do we do in terms of either purchasing or directing schools to purchase specific books to ensure that library? Another portion that I know personally I'm really excited about is the idea that we want to really have a large scale book approval process. So in the curriculum office we are always reading and approving new literature um, for schools to have and we take it really seriously. We have a large team that reviews it for a variety of aspects. Um, is it worth putting in the hands of students, right? Does it have good literature quality? Um, sometimes for our advanced readers we encounter, is it age appropriate in terms of content mixed with reading level appropriate? Well, our thinking is that we would do a large scale book approval and include really focused on a variety of audiences that we don't have enough book approvals in. So how do we specifically vet books related to an LGBTQ audience and resources? How do we increase the number of books we have with African American either characters and or authors? Asian American characters and authors, you know, and it goes on and on. And how do we get more people from outside our curriculum office to be part of that book approval process? So how do we involve students? We often yeah. use school-based staff, reading specialists and content specialists, but how do we think about inc including both parents, students, mm -hmm. community members, yep. um, both on the topic they have a lot of um, knowledge about mm -hmm. and possibly in another topic to kind of mm -hmm. say, um, and that also kind of expands our stakeholder feedback on what is our community interested in having. I just want to add one piece around that, it, and that which is the um, the importance of having these resources across all of our schools, standardizing what every school has, not because we have uh, differences in the library media specialists at school X versus school Y. The other piece that is important is the exposure for our non-LGBTQ students and the importance yep. of that, having resources and in the curriculum for everybody to understand who their peers are in their communities. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to make sure that we continuously think about supporting our LGBTQ students, but we're educating everybody about everybody in our communities, and this is just part of that. Um, and it follows very aligned to board policy ACA. Okay, a lot of print on that area, but we wanted to look beyond ELA. Um, and so one of the big things that our first step is, is a lot of audits, right? We're working with both of our math vendors, both your, uh, Great Minds, who does Eureka Math, and Learn Zillion, um, to audit their math. You know, when people think about math, they may not think about this topic, but what kinds of scenarios are we having in word problems? What kind of pronouns and gendered situations are we having? And so both vendors have agreed to conduct that audit actually for us. Um, and so we'll come back and look at what does that look like? Again, how do we make the entire school day be welcoming and inclusive, as Dr. Navarro said, for the sake of all students? Um, the other area that is um, getting some significant area of attention is secondary social studies. 
Um, so we have a couple of things going on. There's a rewrite of our U.S. history curriculum. And so as we do that work, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the training for teachers, but we're looking at how do we make sure that it is inclusive. Um, and then on top of that, we're actually developing a curriculum um, that is being co-created with teachers and students. Um, it's a history focus, but it also has current issues that are really relevant um, to the LGBTQ community. Um, so next year will be a pilot year, and so we're asking 10 of our schools to pilot this course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually we get, um, and this is this is just a, a show of, of how people are in tune with this topic. We usually get maybe two schools or three schools when we come to you for a request to pilot a course. Mm -hmm. And like Greg said, we had 10 of our high schools actually request cool. to pilot the course. And if you just do the mathematics, it's not just going to be, It's there's going to be a variety of students that are likely to to be in that pilot group. Uh, representative of many of our student demographics so we're very excited about that and we actually need to solidify just a mental note when we're actually coming to the full board to request that pilot approval I'm mm -hmm. sure Maria has it I just need to make sure it's on the agenda yeah. just to emphasize that how do you get that voice data from the students it's not just GSA's talking to their principals and administrators and saying we want this pilot but it's students from the SGA and students just from you know, general population who are not identifiable right. but they're allies and they support that hey my friends and, and, and my classmates and my um, schoolmates we want to be seen and we want to be all of us to be respected going back to Dr. Navarro's point of all. Can I just ask a quick question along those lines and in reference to the commercial that you mentioned um, we had talked last time about putting together a, um, a list that teachers would keep for example so if they're out and there's a substitute that might have notes, um, things that are important to each student, um, and ways to make them continue to feel good in their classroom. Have we implemented that at all? So we have the schools are um, providing student rosters with preferred names. So if there is a preferred name change <laughs> on a class or a course or whatever level it may apply to, schools are providing with the preferred names to help with. Because that that was been that's been one big issue is. You know, we don't have that name in you know, the right. class because right. the substitute was not made aware. The other thing is that, um, I don't know if Greg recalls this, but when he did the training for all of our principals in the room, we did a couple of case scenarios as, as school leaders. One of them was around this issue of a teacher being ex out for an extended period of time, a substitute coming in, and the transitions. And I think Rachel may have also addressed it. She spoke to the principals directly about the work in her school. Um, but we talked about the scenario that was presented to you before around just some key things that, that substitutes needed to have. So it was part of the training that Greg and his folks did earlier this year for administrators uh, of things that they need to um, keep in mind. I just know a lot of times our substitutes don't get quite the training that our yeah. teachers do. So. Um, anything we can do to help make our kids feel better is good. So another important component of the work for us is making sure that all of our instructional staff, our OSIP staff specifically, um, have the knowledge and skills they need, right? They have the desire to move it forward to make sure our schools are inclusive. But what does that look like in terms of work? So OSIP is partnering with Troy's team here um, and thinking about ways to make sure um, that we are both using the teaching tolerance models and some of the equity team. We are building a library of resources um, and supporting some book study. I know I have one right here that I've been reading, Reading the Rainbow, and it was actually shared by a community member. Cool. Um, but really talk specifically about how can you infuse, whether books have LGBTQ characters or not, how can you infuse a larger sense of what identity means. How do you make it more open and inclusive? Um, and so we want to make sure we put those in the hands of the people who may be designing training, leading work, and working with our curricular resources. And again, not just ELA. Making sure that all of our staff are thinking about that as they are pulling resources and getting examples or videos. Um, and then we have the Time to Thrive delegation piece as well. Um, I think for me, this is one of the biggest pieces. When I think about our teachers in our classrooms, how do we make sure that they are ready to teach these topics? And ready in multiple ways. 
it so we have some overall training um, and I think sometimes it gets really tricky it's easier to say overall I want all of my students to feel safe and included in the classroom than to say I'm gonna start reading this book and it might get awkward mm -hmm. um, and I'll be honest especially when I think about our elementary teachers who sometimes try to over sanitize everything mm -hmm. and avoid any controversial topic it's gonna be it's gonna take a lot of work um, and I think about the equity work we've done right and how do you know yourself and then think about others it's mm -hmm. gonna take some specific work to get people to feel comfortable because some will feel like I might mess it up so I'd rather not do it at all mm -hmm. um, how do we help teachers know and feel supported as they move through that process um, and so we're working on what a professional learning plan might look like um, what kind of um, supports can we give leaders which have already started um, and really teachers um, a specific example will be that U.S. history training will specifically address that because it's coming up as training and there's some support for the middle and high school RTs that we're planning to give this summer. Um, when you give those trainings do you um, allow like parents and students to come and speak to the teachers to give personal experiences or anything? So I think that would be a great lead-in for you know the why um, I think as we start to plan it we will really have to compel the same way we may actually have to buy the books to make sure every school has them how do we help everyone say again thinking about the book I just read after reading it you're like how could you not in every classroom but we need some of that to really make sure um, that people get over their concerns and they're trying to do the best they can right they're trying to make sure that nobody is is upset but how do we how do we move it forward okay um, Greg talked about this a little bit but student voice right how do we tap into our older students to think what they may have benefited from in their elementary years um, and how do we um, again this one's kind of social studies specific but can we do a curriculum advisory um, in terms of thinking about how we plan moving forward Dr. Navarra mentioned this earlier um, but OSIP is working on a partnership with a human rights campaign they are the group that sponsor Time to Thrive, as well as Welcoming Schools. It's a website that many people may be familiar with that has a lot of online resources um, that have both lesson plans for teachers as well as lots of professional development modules. Um, some of that is available online, but the beauty of a partnership is we could definitely take it steps further, um, customize, get more support um, from them in terms of what the actual professional development would look like. Um, if you just take a brief look at all the different modules they have, it really does what we were just describing, going from kind of high level to really how do you specifically um, move this work forward. Um, welcoming schools, uh, welcoming spaces. Um, I think we already talked a little bit about the middle and high school work, but thinking about how do we start to move that work to elementary school um, and our, me our library media team is thinking about really taking the lead on some of that work, doing some analysis of it, as they think about that oftentimes libraries and elementary schools are a nice, quiet, safe place. Mm -hmm. um, how, do we, how do we maybe make that even an increase to being a welcoming space? Um, the one I definitely don't wanna forget is parental awareness. Um, this is kind of a next step we have on the slide, which would be information nights. But one of the pieces that we need to make sure to do as we move this work forward is make sure we're hearing from um, a large number of parents in our system. We have some parents who are definitely doing their job to be the advocates um, mm -hmm. for themselves, their families, their students. But when we think about the, the structures we have in place, the curriculum advisories and some of the ongoing parent groups, how do we make sure that we get their input and feedback around what this work looks like? How do we move it forward? Why is it important for all students um, mm -hmm. and all families to experience it? So that's another piece of the work. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over. So, just highlighting some of the examples that are taking place in schools. Um, one of the pieces of work that, again, Greg mentioned earlier was that over the summer my team pulled in members of the um, LGBTQ community as well as advocates to talk about their experience because as we develop um, a learning progression training around this work, we want, we always like to build on student voice. Um, and so one of the students um, commented that I've been uncomfortable in situations when staff is uninformed. Mm -hmm. And so the work that we need to do as a system is continue to build awareness mm -hmm. so that 
people can do that self-reflective work so that we can understand those that are, may have different lived experiences so that we respond differently. So one example of this is the work around One Whitman. And it's multi-layered. So it really started with um, the principal Dodd pulling uh, students together in circles to talk about various issues. Um, some of the topics, um, you know, really focused on how do we create inclusive spaces? How do students get to know one another as individuals? Um, and folks that come from different racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, um, members of the LGBTQ community, um, and other communities. So how do we become one Whitman? So they've also um, combined their work or aligned their work with ADO and No Place for Hate. So that serves as some of the groundwork for um, the work they're doing in schools. They do it doing homeroom. So they have students, about 30 students in a circle, and they talk about the various topics, danger of a single story, um, suicide prevention, different topics um, that help create an inclusive space. One of the things that they're doing, because a good leader refines the process, listens to students' voice, and some of the students were like, oh, this isn't good, but it could be better. And so they're refining their process, making groups smaller so that conversations are more intimate and kids get to know each um, one another better. As another component, um, my team um, has come in to do parent workshops around how to talk about race that have been really successful. So far, they've had two um, nice turnout, great conversations, and we'll continue that work as part of the larger practice of building an inclusive space around lots of different um, issues because we want to look at it through um, multiple factors of diversity and intersectionality. So we all live in different places even though we present ourselves one way, we have lots of different places in which we live. And so making sure that we're looking at you know all of students' identities. So that's the work that they have been doing at Whitman and will continue to do. And Bannard Rustin is another school that has engaged in the work. Um, from the very beginning, um, I remember I was working with, um, a at A&S, and, a and, and we were talking about the, the, um, the, um, some of our policy work, and Rachel was in the audience, and she's like, I'm opening my school. <coughs> My school is named after an African-American gay civil rights um, person. And I really want to elevate that, elevate who he was as part of our school culture. And so we talked about it. It's like, well, what, why don't we try circles and, and really engaging staff around being able to have conversations and being the culturally re, um, responsive leader that she is, she went back and she implemented um, um, a program that goes on um, because that's just part of who they are now. So she first informed them about the policies, um, um, the ACA policy in particular, and made sure that staff were um, aware these things existed, along with the um, guidelines um, for LGBTQ students. Um, and again, really having an ongoing discussion of around how do we create inclusive spaces for our students, for our families, um, that elevate and exemplify the name that our school is given. So Rachel also is helping other schools. Just recently, she engaged with work with Ashburton, where they, their staff wanted to um, begin their journey around this work. And so Rachel kindly came out and presented um, and built awareness and the staff at Ashburton were just like, oh, this is some of the best training we've ever um, received. Can I jump in? Mm -hmm. Specifically, and I was at this particular training and, and they did a, a community circle with staff and one particular staff member said, um, who identifies LGBT, said, I've been teaching here seven years, and this is the first time I really felt a part of this school. And that's powerful. And that's the work mm -hmm. that is not just being you know, kicked off in, in these schools, but other schools that are having this. That's the impact that it's having on our staff and mm -hmm. our students and our communities. 
Yeah, and the work does continue in many other schools. Frost, we're in the process of working with, um, doing some work. Actually, they're testing out some of the um, work we're doing for a module we're creating, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. So we're using them as a testing ground to see um, with some of the content. And, um, and um, Rosa Parks has been engaged in the work in a long time and really most recently in November did a conference. They typically have a conference where they invite other middle schools in mm -hmm. around diversity issues that the students lead, but they hadn't done it in their school until this year. So they took a day, I think it was the day before Thanksgiving um, holiday, and the whole school engaged in learning, which was led by students. And again, when we talk about the vision for the work in every school, um, again, around creating those inclusive spaces, whether we're talking about LGBTQ students, um, Latino, African American, Asian, various religion, religious groups, special, special education, mm -hmm. ESOL, how do we create these ongoing conversations and engagements to create those spaces that we like? And then finally, our team is working on designing um, a supporting LGBTQ students and families module. And again, this kind of grew out of the community student um, and, and, and educator voice around issues around LGBTQ plus students and how we can better serve them. And so we've really been working hard with not only partners in central office, but school-based partners. And again, pulling in the voices of students and stakeholders um, to really provide an awareness building um, opportunity for staff to think about these issues that they may not think about. Um, you know, as much as we engage in this work, I always learn something new, and that's why I love what I do, because you never know it all. Um, and so through this process, I've learned a lot of things that I just never thought about. Um, and so one of the things that I'm really proud of is the work we're doing, particularly um, around intersectionality. So looking at the LGBTQ student experience through multiple lens, because it doesn't look the same for everyone and the experience isn't the same. And oftentimes, um, people of color's voices are miss missing in the data and in the conversation. So again, being the equity unit, making sure that we bring in various perspectives and lived experiences so that um, you know, we, can't, we don't look at a group of people, just like we talk about when we talk about race and ethnicity, that, everybody, that every group is the same or behaves the same or has the same lived experiences. So I'm excited about this work, and we're going to roll out our first module later this um, spring, and then we hope to incorporate it um, into our progression of training for staff. And we welcome you all to come, if you'd like. That would be great. Invite us, let us know when you're doing it. I will. We'll start with my colleagues. Dr. Dr. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. I don't think I saw and hear anything about non-binary. Is that how you say it? But that should be part of it as well. Oh, okay. Um, and I also, I have a concern on slide 14 that we talk about tolerance. Um, I don't think, well, uh, it's something that I've argued with and we put it in the policy that tolerance means I'm putting up with you and that's not what we want, mm -hmm. but in the one Whitman, you do have uh, acceptance and respect for all, mm -hmm. which I prefer. So I don't know whether yes. the program is called tolerance. That's, uh, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. They well, we should change be, it. <laughs> they need to get some. We change uh, names yeah, all the time. Need some help on that. <laughs> and I think we've moved a long way because I see Dr. Grant is over there. Yeah, in the health program, mm -hmm. um, for a long time we weren't allowed to talk about this mm -hmm. unless the student brought it up, and also about uh, anything that had to do with sex ed. So this is really good that we're working with students and with parents and all of our staff and going out. Thank you. I want to comment on that? So. If you remember years ago with Katrina, we put race on the table, and it was a district-wide, this is what we're focusing on. Well, that's been the message, is, is this is on the table. This is conversation pre-K through 12. 
and again, not just the LGBTQ, but that non-discrimination ACA for all of our students mm -hmm. to make sure any of our kids are able to navigate through their schools and see themselves and feel respected and valued. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, that was a good point. If we could change the name, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> to change the company. Well, you know. <laughs> um, did you have anything else, Dr. I miss some of us. I wanted to understand um, the issue that you brought up about substitute teachers and using preferred name. Is there a way to enter the preferred name in the system so that we foolproof uh, this example? So we do have it in our student information system. We can change the name. And currently? So, yes, mm -hmm. currently. Okay. And uh, with our new Synergy system coming on July 1, we actually have enhanced for your preferred gender as well is, is, is more information for the school to have um, to have access to. Do you have to Again, have parent per approval to change a kid's name? You do not. But if you change it in the system officially with through enrollment and through the registrar, mm -hmm. then yes. And that has there's a much more stringent process for officially changing it on for the state and for the state exams and things like that. So what is the issue with substitutes if it's already in place? So um, Some kids haven't we haven't been as maybe as consistent as we needed to be to make sure that what we're providing with a substitute at the beginning of the day is the um, and we're, we're much better this year and even last year, but over the course of um, as we've gotten up to this point, the consistency has been a part of it as well as just making sure that everybody understands the steps and the uh, that we need to take so. Um, you mentioned in one of your slides about privacy issues. Could you help me understand some of the confidentiality or privacy issues that are at play? Um, I think it was one of the last ones. So in, in general, I think part of the discussion is that our, pol our procedures following <coughs> alignment to policy ACA um, do allow a student, we keep the confidentiality of a student. So for example, if a student is not out to their parents, but comes to schools and says, I, uh, my preferred gender is different from my biological gender, the school system will create ways to support uh, and develop a plan on how to support the student um, during their school day. And it is very explicit, and this is part of the trainings that we have with administrators, the student's rights and responsibilities, um, around supporting the student needs and addressing the student needs. Um, so, so that's ongoing professional development yeah. and mm -hmm. emphasizing that with principals. And, mm -hmm. and it's different conversations at different levels as well. A fourth grade conversation with this might be different than, than a ninth or tenth grader depending on where they are mm -hmm. in the, the um, understanding themselves or being able to articulate to their counselor. Um, there's a range of support on that form when they meet with a counselor and your parent support is at a, between a one and a ten and that helps a counselor really have a deep conversation about what this means for example when promotion comes and we're going to announce your name and your parents have no idea this could be a this could be a situation yes. or as it, we, we try to and we've trained Plus counselors we, Bless you. Um, spelling out all the possible scenarios for the students so that they, we encourage the conversations with the parents and the students in the school. Um, it's just really, each case is taken individually so that we're, we're best protecting the confidentiality and the respect of the student. But we also want them to be aware of what this means as we move forward with different things. And when the parent comes in and said, I'm here to pick up my daughter and people in the office are looking like, we don't have somebody of that name. But this is conversations that the, the school has to have with amongst each other. We don't want to out a student if someone comes and picks up their child and isn't aware of this. But mm -hmm. each again, each of these, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're complicated situations mm -hmm. and scenarios. Mm -hmm. And so those conversations are really important to have, starting with the student and moving forward with the, the adults who work with that child. And part of what we want, because we have changes in leadership and staff at the schools, is that the schools do not feel like they have to figure this out on their own. Mm -hmm. So they are calling our central offices for support <coughs> to talk through how this, how we support a school, how we look at evidence, how we go out there and work alongside with the schools as they're thinking about a plan. And as Greg mentioned, these could be plans that follow students for multiple years 
as there's sort of dynamics changes, they get older, their relationships with families and their uh, close-knit communities. Um, so these are places where we also want to be very clear to schools that they're not alone in, 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 in figuring these things out, that we are here for support mm -hmm. uh, to them and, you know, technical support and just walking through those cases. So that's just an important piece mm -hmm. to this work. I heard you mention staff. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that you mentioned staff because that's an often neglected uh, component of our school systems and just, you know, keep those that uh, on, on the forefront as well. We have a lot of work to do uh, to helping them feel welcome and, and included. Uh, this is a side note, but um, uh, today we heard about good parent and system partnerships between in terms of the GT uh, parent network as well as special education, uh, LGBT. We have some advocates in the room. Um, I hope that as we build our ESOL parent group that this is the kind, this is the benefit mm -hmm. of having a strong and robust and vibrant parent and community uh, working with us on these issues. And I know we're rebuilding our ESOL parent uh, a group and uh, this, is the, this is what we want to see as a result of that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to kind of piggyback on that about the all, all making sure all of our staff um i had a conversation with a young man who um, was telling me that he would leave home and then change um to dress the way you know he wanted to feel and um didn't want his parents but uh, you know who do they go to then at the school if they don't necessarily know? And so making sure that not just our counselors, but the front office staff and the cafeteria staff, you know, all of our support staff, it's, I think is really important that we give them the training. Um, just also about those information sheets. Part of it was for the, how do I, um, how to reference our students and stuff, but it's also, there are some little things like, um, some of our special needs kids like to have headphones on or things like that that just so that um, someone new in the building can have an idea of what um, our kids are used to and need and, and generally have um, and the you know, last thing I want to say is I think this is really good work I feel like we've come a long way obviously there's always more to be done like with all of our topics um, but I would like to really strongly advocate that each one of our schools at least our secondary schools have an aspect of this topic in the mental health day um, that we mental health uh, that day that we've been working on, um, whether it's student presentation or an educational um, presentation. I feel like it's a good opportunity. You know, we know that there are a lot more mental health concerns with these communities um, and not feeling um, included and, and respected and appreciated. So um, anything we can do to help promote that to system-wide, school-wide, I think would be very beneficial. So I would love to see that as part of our mental health support. I did want to end on a positive note. This is all positive work, yes. and I thank exactly. you. Exactly. It's all good. Uh, and I thank you for the work. Um, this is working. Mm -hmm. uh, my middle schooler came home telling me that her Spanish teacher had taught them how to say they, ella, ello, ellos, ellas, ellos in mm -hmm. Spanish in non-gender specific way. And, it, and so I said, hey. <laughs> it's getting it's to reaching. the classroom. It's getting there. So the thank word you. of the year, really Webster's lovely. word of the year was was they. The, really? the most searched word for the year in the pronoun form of wow. they. So the, the energy is, is, is globally, and we want to make sure we're supported. And, you know, I, I just want to thank the members of the community and the staff that are here with us today. I just, you know, we have a lot of um, folks who, have, who really work alongside with us and who engage with us, uh, both from the community um, and our own staff that are sort of getting themselves um, up and ready to, to really help the schools. And also to thank the schools. The schools have done an amazing job. Um, you know, I, I, I was very um, candidly surprised when, you know, my kids came home and understood and could tell me what the difference is around a uh, transgender student, what is a gay and a lesbian, mm -hmm. and we're using those terms and they're in elementary schools and just the, the courage of our schools to really, again, teach everybody about 
the community that they live in mm -hmm. and the members of the community that they live in. So I just want to do a really big shout out because the school system really has um, has been working around listening to the community and what, what professional development do they need to know. And I will just do a shout out also to um, our SEIU uh, leadership. They were very open and supportive to uh, lots of different trainings and many of our SEIU members are the first people, uh, bus drivers yep. that our kids see. Yep. They are the ones that greet the parents when they come into our schools. And so shout out to just how the staff has sort of reacted proactively and said, yes, we're open, we're willing to tell us where to go, we'll be there. Um, so just kudos to the system for really doing this. Lots more work needs to get done. Lots more learning needs to get done. We hire anywhere between 900 and 1,000 teachers every year. So this is not going to end. We need to just make it part of our culture. Yeah. But entrenching it into must-do professional learning that everybody must have and then additional pieces that everybody needs to know as an employee of MCPS is a good way to start. Yes. Dr. Daka, did you have any? Final comments? Uh, no, I was. I, I thank you for all the work that you've done. It is a far cry from the way it used to be, and uh, we didn't touch any of this. And it's really much better for students. And you talk about the mental health issues, uh, and this is really going to help a lot. And I'm thinking about those substitutes. I'm thinking, how can we really? Do we train them? We don't. I know it's it's kind of hard because they don't work. Yeah. Yeah, they need to be aware of this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But there are some of these things that aren't spelled out that we have to make sure. Okay. That yeah, sometimes it takes more than one conversation, too. Okay. And I have to say, I want to echo the comments of Dr. Navarro um, in thanking our community and our staff and everybody for the work that they've done on this. Um, I always really appreciate hearing from our community members who you know, have questions or ideas or thoughts for advocacy. Um, it's very helpful for us to know. Um, Kind of what they want to see in the, what the work that we're doing on a daily basis um and i think it's great this what you said about your kids coming home and stuff because i think part of the problem with people not wanting to talk about it is the uh, just the uncomfortableness of even not wanting to offend somebody if you say something wrong the wrong way or whatever so the more we're talking about it openly um i think the less of that there will hopefully be so um if unless anybody has any other comments or thoughts no no thank you okay thank you. Thank you so absolutely much. thank you so then i guess that pretty much covers us <laughs> and um thank you for um all the work that you did putting this all together and bringing your teams together have a good one we're adjourned <laughs>